So the best predictor for entrepreneurial success, first is IQ, but second is trade openness, which is the creativity dimension. Mm -hmm. So entrepreneurial types tend to be very high in trade openness. And so that sets them with the artists and also with the political liberals, because the best predictor of political liberalism is trade openness. So the managers and administrative types, they tend to be conservative and the entrepreneurial and creative types tend to be liberal. And so if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to be a lateral thinker. And so you'll be the sort of person, if they hear an idea, if you hear an idea, that will trigger off a whole bunch of other ideas. And you'll be motivated primarily by interest in pursuing your ideas. But your, your downfall is likely to be organizational administrative ability. So it's often useful for entrepreneurial types to pair themselves with managerial and administrative type. If you're gonna be an entrepreneur, you almost have the opposite profile as a soldier. You're very high in openness and you're lower in conscientiousness or at least conscientiousness is irrelevant. And the reason for that seems to be that like if you're an orderly person and you like to follow procedures and rules, it's kind of hard for you to start a company because when you first start a company or engage in any other creative process, because entrepreneurs turn out to be the same as artists, you kind of have to, you're not operating within a rule governed structure. In fact, there may be many times where you have to break a small rule to to move properly at a higher level of analysis there's there's no algorithmic way of generating a new company right obviously and so it's people who are very high in openness who happen to be good entrepreneurs and so this is something i thought was extraordinarily cool because we we'd also already known what predicts managerial administrative and academic ability and iq is crucial for any complex job, so we'll just leave that behind. But what predicts academic ability, for example, at the University of Toronto, is in intelligence, obviously, but also conscientiousness. The correlation between creativity and grades at the U of T is zero, zero. Turns out to be conscientiousness that's the excellent predictor of graduate student performance. That's the best predictor for law. It's the best predictor for managerial positions. It's the best predictor for administrative positions. Anything that has a structure of rules that needs to be applied, conscientiousness is a great predictor. So, but it's not good for predicting artistic ability or entrepreneurial ability. And that's also really important because one of the things, this is partly why bureaucracies stultify, right? Because what happens is they, as they develop, they get chock full of conscientious people with a few psychopaths thrown in there just for good measure. They get chock full of, of conscientious people busily zooming efficiently down a single track and then all of a sudden the landscape shifts and they're going very very efficiently in exactly the wrong direction and then the whole bloody thing falls apart so you need to have some creative wing nuts in your organization to come up with completely absurd ideas that might just on the off chance be true and so creativity is strange in that manner too because it's a high risk high return game you're a lot safer in your life to find a functioning entity and to operate as a cog within it, as long as the entity keeps functioning. Because if you're creative and you go off on tangents all the time, there's some probability that one of those tangents is gonna be exactly what is needed at the time and you're gonna become hyper successful as a consequence. But there's much more probability that even though your, some of your ideas might be highly valuable, the probability that this is the right time and place for them is extraordinarily low. So to produce a successful creative product, for example, in the marketplace, you need a ridiculous combination of creativity so that you keep generating ideas and then a, a network around you of people who have skills that you don't and then the production of, a, of a, a product, let's say, whatever that happens to be, that's actually in demand by the marketplace at exactly that moment and that someone else hasn't already done better. So the, the sensible thing to tell anybody who wants to be creative is that's stupid. You shouldn't do it. It's, it's your probability of success is so low that it's better just to do something sensible. But the problem with that is that creative people can't do that because they're creative. And if they shut down their creativity, it's like an extrovert who's gone to live in a, you know, in an isolated cell, a creative person who isn't being creative. They just, they just wither and die. So they're stuck with it. So, but it is a high risk, high return strategy. You know, I think I mentioned this to you before. If you write a book, which is virtually impossible and then get a publisher, which is virtually impossible, you probably have a rejection rate of 99%. So then if you do 
if you do manage to publish the book with a reasonable publisher, which you won't because it's impossible, then you get 8% royalties. That's it. So 92% of your labor goes to the sales, marketing, and distribution end of things. And so it's just, so it's very, very difficult to, to generate capital as an entrepreneur. And there's, there's innumerable impediments. One of the things that people do, and this is something for those of you who might be entrepreneurially minded, here's another thing that you have to understand is that you can't really create a product and then launch it. Because first of all, you don't know how to do that. You might know how to create the product, but you do not know how to market or sell it. You don't know how to advertise it. You don't know how to communicate about it. You don't know how to ship it. Like there's all sorts of things you just don't know. But worse is you don't know if people will use it. And so what companies do that, gen that roll out new products on a relatively continual basis do is they don't develop the product and then go sell it. They continually communicate with their customers about what product the customer is willing to buy next and then they develop that. And so you have to have your market identified and then you have to be in continual communication with the market while you develop the product. It's not, I build a better mousetrap and the world comes you know, marching to my door. That isn't how it works, is that you got to find out if someone wants to buy your stupid thing. And then the next thing is, is that even if you have a great thing, you're going to go talk to people and they have 50 great things that they might buy. And they're all great, but they're not going to buy all 50. They might buy one, maybe, and maybe they'll buy it this week, but probably they'll buy it in six months. And they're not going to buy any of them, no matter how great, unless they're on fire and you're selling water. Because they're so busy already, Right? They're so overwhelmed and preoccupied by their jobs that if you come in and you say, well, here, this is going to increase your efficiency by 20%, and here's the three weeks you'd have to spend doing that, and then the payoff would come in the next years, they'll say, yeah, well, I'll do that as soon as I have time. And as soon as I have time is never. So if they're on fire and you have water, you can sell it to them. But that's all, because otherwise it's a no-go. So those are all things that, that are worthwhile knowing because they're very hard to learn because I know that artistic types are also entrepreneurial types. They're the same personality types. And so it's very much worthwhile to make an economic and practical case for this sort of thing. You study literature in the humanities so that you can familiarize yourself with the wisdom of our civilization. Man, you should do that because people have been working on this thing for a long time and it's rich beyond comparison. So why wouldn't you do that? And you teach yourself to, to read and you teach yourself to speak and you teach yourself to think and you teach yourself to communicate. And I can tell you, if you can read and think and, and communicate, you are absolutely 100% unstoppable. There's absolutely no downside to it.